All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to part two of Crossing the Tiber. Mike Pantile here with the handsome, virtuous CMAS crew, Will Nolan, Nick Stumphauser, Tim Gordon. How you fellas doing? Good, Mike. Excellent. Excellent. Good. Last week's episode was edifying for myself and for many people that were listening to it and, and, and watched it. Um, and so, you know, there were so many other questions that we had by the end of it. And uh, I'm glad we're doing a part two because, you know, this is, again, not just selfishly Am I learning? But I think there's a lot of people we're seeing a a resurgence of people coming to the Catholic faith or at least inquiring about it, uh, many of which are are Protestants that have these questions. Um, and there really isn't like a, a go to place on YouTube in the podcast sphere that answers all these questions. So um, I think this is a great continuation of last week's conversation. And also, too, just to kind of formally announce, because there's a lot of people in the in the comments are like, is Mike Protestant? Is Mike Protestant? I guess technically right now I am. But. Lord willing, if the Lord is willing and the creek don't rise, I'm getting confirmed as a Catholic May 7th. I'm just putting that out there. Um, so all my fellow Catholic brethren, please pray for me. You know, the, the, the Satan hates the Catholic Church and everything that he represents. So I would appreciate the prayer. Now, getting into this part two, I have a few questions here. So if any of you guys want to address any one in particular, I, I figured let's just, you know, jump back into where we left off last week. Um, the topic of salvation and non-Catholics. We were just speaking about this before we hit the record. Um, what do you guys have to say? Can non-Catholics be saved and go to heaven? We'll start with you, Will. Yeah, so what I was talking about is that technically it's possible. You have to be clear, though, on what the conditions for that possibility are. So if we take you as an example, Mike, given that you are currently going through your reversion from your lapsed Catholicism when you were a kid to coming back into communion with the church. If you at this point feeling that obligation to join the church because you believe it is the truth, if you at this point then decided, no, I'm going to choose my own path, even though I feel that obligation to join what I recognize as Christ's church at that point, you become a heretic, which is literally a chooser. That's what heretic means if you go back to the etymology of the word. Mm -hmm. And if you recognize the Catholic Church as true and you choose to stay outside it, then no salvation. Let's say, though, that there's another Protestant who is sincerely convinced that whatever Protestant sect he is in is the true one. I can't see how that would be the case, personally, given how all of them admit that they aren't infallible. So where's he getting that certainty from? Let's say, though, that for some reason he truly believes that this is the right one and his conscience is not convicting him, saying you've got to join that Catholic church. You have an obligation to be in that fold. That's the truth. Then possibly he could be saved. So there's a difference between the two situations. You know that the Catholic church is the truth and God's calling you to it. At that point, you've got to go with it. Someone else, though, out of ignorance, still trying to live a good life and follow Christ and do God's will, technically could be saved. And I brought up the example with Tim's help reminding me of the guy's name. There was one Father Leonard Feeney, who in 1949 in the U.S. began to preach that um, Protestants were certainly doomed to hell. So certainly. And he was warned by Archbishop Cushing of Boston and then by the Holy See itself that that preaching was wrong and misrepresented Catholic teaching. Uh, he just wanted to carry on propagating it. And then in the end, he was excommunicated by Rome and expelled from the church. So that's the example that proves the point about what I'm saying, that technically it is possible for Protestants to be saved given a few conditions. Tim can probably explain it better, though. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I think maybe maybe the church, because it's announced extra ecclesium nulla salus outside the church, none can be saved. The the, the way the church formulates herself might be out, um, under the conditions for the possibility of being a Protestant and not willfully deigning against the church. We might say there's a possibility that um, not all Protestants are damned, but God is committed to the sacraments, but he's not constrained by them. 
So, I mean, Protestants were basically people that were like, sacraments, what are those? And they like threw them into the fire along with everything out, you know, bishops, priests, the, the idea of church itself, um, many books of the Bible, <laughs> just so much. The, the real practice of Christianity was gone. But through that belief in Jesus alone and through um, something that did exist even before the announcement of extra ecclesium nullus solus called baptism by desire, you would say, well, they're, they're not certainly damned. The church never wants to fully contradict that outside the church, none can be saved. But it is noteworthy to say that that the church always announced that in really in special cases that you, you don't want to find yourself being the exception to the rule. You don't want to bank on being the exception to the rule in very special cases. Yeah. If your desire for God is so great and you're just finding him through the wrong, even Christian channels, Protestant ones or whatever, or, you know, in uh, darkest Peru or darkest Africa, you know, someone truly has the desire for God and just through their, through time and space can't find them. Then uh, it, it is very important to say that even Aquinas, um, Bellarmine Suarez, guys this far back um, acknowledged there's something called a baptism by desire, which, which mm -hmm. gets, gets true, true desires after God um, over, over the hump we're taught. That's why, that's why Feeney, was um, condemned and excommunicated. Tim, I just remembered there's a bit in uh, Glenn's Apologetics, which I know is a book that you really like as well, yes. when he explains this distinction. So listen to this. Uh, those who are within the Catholic Church are all her actual members, and also those who are not her members, but sincerely believe that the church to which they belong is the true church. The actual members of the Catholic Church constitute the body of the church. Non-Catholics who are honestly convinced that their own sect is the true church are, provided they are in the state of grace, members of the soul of the Catholic Church. It's an interesting distinction, isn't it? So it's the idea that even though you're not formally a member of the Catholic Church, in spirit, you can still be Catholic. And I think that's why you can be saved. That's such a good distinction. I, I forgot that book deals with it, but Paul, Paul J. Glenn, I think is his father, Paul J. Glenn. So, so good. That orange apologetics book. Yeah. Mike, you Classic. should, yeah. you, you, you have that one. It's so good. I like the Classic. way, Will, that you gave, you gave Mike that little goosing where you're like, Hey, someone in, I don't know, say <laughs> Mike's position. If you were to decide <laughs> not to come back into the church, not saved. <laughs> That's why I'm like, trying to get this done. I was presented yeah. the two dates, either next Easter uh, the vigil or May 7th. I'm like, let's go May 7th, like full steam ahead. I'm not a heretic. <laughs> That's it. Well, I started angling for Mike like 18 months ago on Instagram, just like it's true. Casting. Now I'm just reeling him in. So the last bit is now, Mike, it's, it's Catholicism or hell. <laughs> well we did you, the fun you, part you, first now, yeah, now it's just the brass tax and it's so true you were doing it in in your own gentle way behind the scenes for a while i never thought it was going to happen i mean glory to god nick do you have anything to add to this topic my friend yeah just the propositional landscape of from, from on the spectrum from we'll say protestantism where it's like some super niche sect like the First West North Borough Baptists of 1517 reformed. And then on the all, all the way on the other side, you have the, the Catholic Church. I think it's interesting that the vast majority of Protestants consider themselves to be non denominational mm -hmm. because they see it as like the most serious, <laughs> you know? And as Will was expressing, you know, the situation that you're in versus the situation that the theoretical Protestant would be in. I was considering that, okay, why is it that most Protestants sort of know intuitively, like, okay, well, we can't be so specific to say that like this one tiny niche sect got it right. Like they sort of intuitively understand what Will is saying about like, you need a claim of infallibility and the closest they can get is saying, well, like, I just follow the Bible, bro. Like, you know, they, they export their responsibility to scripture so that they don't have to acknowledge the fact that, you want to go with the, uh, or you at least want to confront the organization making the boldest claim. 
And that, in my own reversion, that was kind of why I didn't spend any time with Protestantism and any time with Orthodoxy is just because I knew that the, like the, the biggest, scariest proposition was what the Catholic Church was saying. They're like, we are, we're not mostly right. We're 100% right. And if you disagree with us, you're going to hell. And for me, I was like, okay, I'll take you seriously. I'll, I'll listen to what you have to say and see if you're right first. And then, you know, ended up just losing. I just, I described my reversion as just losing the battle against the church. Like I was, I was far weaker than, than the hound of heaven. So there's a question um, that came up. I think I was, I was talking to one of my friends and he said, I believe at the council of Trent, it was declared that there is no salvation outside the church. Uh, and this is a question selfishly too. Um, I mean, what is the real answer here, right? Or is there, are there these exceptions um, like such as the case of like a baby that hasn't been baptized, but dies is entrusted to the mercy of God. That's my understanding of, of the teaching. Um, is that what was actually said in the council of Trent, or may, maybe I'm, I'm mistakenly getting the wrong council. Um, is that, is that a teaching that's universally agreed upon? Well, that's no salvation been, outside the church. We, we, uh, when people read that and don't understand what it means is where the problems arise. But mm. the examples we've just been given clarify the meaning so that right. you could be uh, formally non-Catholic and yet still be saved. So I think the misunderstanding arises from someone just picking up the Trent Catechism and reading it and thinking, oh, this must mean that there's no way anybody who's not Catholic can go to heaven, which isn't mm. the case. Yeah, and it's what... Yeah. It's what uh people like Chris Hitchens um, and Richard Dawkins would use as cannon fodder for their atheist arguments where they'd say like, okay, so a baby, right? Oh, a baby dies. And you're saying God damns this baby to hell because it wasn't baptized or something. I actually distinctly remember Chris Hitchens going on this, uh, this little tirade about how there was, there was no discussion of limbo until Vatican one. Was it or Vatican two? when limbo was i think it was vatican one that um limbo became uh because there's purgatory and then limbo which is where like it went and then they just got rid of limbo <clears throat> and they're like oh just kidding that's not a thing and and hitch was using this as as sort of a um an attack on the church for creating and destroying beliefs that uh tortured the feelings of of mothers and whatnot and i with the example that Will just gave, if a, a Protestant who is sincere of heart and ignorant of the truth can be saved, like a baby's fine, but but that's not what's articulated, and so it's used as these arguments to, to make Catholicism seem barbaric and and calloused. Mm. Well, with the with with the massacre of the infants under Herod, um, that's the it's baptism by blood right tim technically they're yeah. saints aren't they yeah right. yeah yeah we we just celebrate well not that recently celebrated their feast day yeah and the ex the expression um extra ecclesium nola solis comes from the third century it's saint cyprian of carthage uh who first used the expression but yeah it gets sort of codified at trent and it had, it had almost always included those exceptions um baptisms by blood and desire uh, baptism by fire or something else but uh, in reference to the holy spirit but uh, yeah it's just it's exception makes bad law and as as i say on my show all the time you announce the rule right when we announce um i don't know in court there, there's no hearsay evidence i mean you, you probably know this is why you swear in witnesses oh we don't allow hearsay in here well it turns out Evidence is the hardest class in law school because there are like 45 exceptions and they're rather expansive and you have to memorize all of the exceptions, almost like the exception swallows the rule. But you still, everyone knows there's no hearsay in court. You're not allowed to swear in uh, B about something that happened to A and, and, and for B to cite C. We just want to swear in C directly so that the jury can look at, look at C swearing his own words do you swear what you're about to say is true yeah it's easier to lie if you're if it's b talking about c's words as hearsay so it's still valid what folks have to understand out there people that haven't studied 
philosophy and logic deeply is that I hate to sound like Oliver Wendell Holmes, but almost all rules have exceptions. That doesn't mean there aren't exceptionless rules, but they're very rare in this world, the way God created the world. And it doesn't mean you don't announce the maxim. The maxim is extra ecclesium nulla salus. And if you're banking, dear Protestant listener out there, on being one of the ones like, well, I'm kind of hearing this. I, I watch C-Mask every week. I watch Nolan Knows. I watch Gordon's channel. I've been listening to Mike Pentile. I'm, I'm looking at Nick Stumphauser, who came back into the church, <laughs> you, you know, semi-recently. And, and I'm just, I'm kind of still in between. It's like, you should assume that it's a strict scrutiny God will apply to you and and, and that God will be like, for 99.9% for .9 of you extra ecclesium nola solos, you know enough. Don't assume that what that your knowledge is not culpable mens rea to condemn you. you. You have enough out there. In the age of the internet, pretty much everyone has enough. So extra ecclesium nola solos does not have nearly so expansive a set of parameters for its own exception as even the rule of evidence does. And everyone knows, no hearsay in court. Mm -hmm. I, I would actually yeah. <clears throat> say anyone who's listened to the previous C-Mask episode on this, plus this one, and is still thinking, oh, I, I never really heard enough evidence to make me think that the Catholic Church needs to be taken seriously. You think twice for the reason yeah. that Tim just outlined there. Because even if you'd never heard them, that ignorance is still culpable because it's on you to actually make the serious search and investigate. But if you've just had things neatly packaged like this and set out for you and you've gone through it and it isn't pricking your conscience, you're not going to do a bit more reading or go back and watch some other episodes, then exactly what Tim said applies. Yeah. And that's, and that kind of answers my, that next question was how do you really, <laughs> how do you know that you're ignorant versus just holding on to these um, emotional preconceived ideas about the church. And this is precisely what convicted me. Okay. Because this is what people don't realize. Um, when you're a Protestant, there's a, there's a big piece of your heart that's hardened, whether you like to acknowledge it or not. And it's, there's a lack of humility that is disallowing you from going back and actually doing some honest research on the church. As a leader of my family is my responsibility to ensure that they get into heaven or the closest thing to it. And this is what led me down this deep dive. I had all of these Protestant tropes and no rebuttals to when you guys brought up points of argumentation. I could not defend my faith. I just fell back on, it's just the Bible. So in not just experiencing the, the enrichness, the enriching of my faith through this process and now feeling like the Bible has come alive and just jumping out of this book with this, this walk, it's been a fundamentally humbling process. So like my recommendation to anybody listening, it's like, if you're listening to this podcast, like I was as a Protestant for a year and a half prior to this, um, it would behoove you to do more research and humble your heart in understanding that pre 15th century, there's a lot there for you to understand and for you to know and pleading ignorance. Now understanding this exception, you are no longer ignorant. Would you say that's pretty safe to say? Mm -hmm. You got to be careful yeah. guys. And and Mike, I think the emphasis that you're placing on the journey of the heart is something that I, I try to emphasize to people because I spent seven years doing this research game and worshiping my own intellect and thinking that I could just listen to another debate on YouTube or read another book or listen to another audiobook, yep. and And that would get me over the hump and I would achieve peace and certainty. And I did that for seven years hmm. and it drove me insane. And now looking back, it's quite clear that it was never about my intellect. And that's not to say that the church is not a rational institution. It is. That's what we've been discussing are the rational points. But your point about the journey of the heart, I think, is so vital for people who may, maybe aren't academically inclined or don't have the, the patience or the time to go through years and years of research and read all these books and stuff like that is just okay i would say it's it's often scarier to interrogate yourself and and figure out where is this this vitriol coming from and mm -hmm. what leverage does protestantism give me right is there a sin that i'm attached to or a way of life that i'm attached to that is permissive permitted by protestantism that i would have to give up 
it's probably going to be something closer to that. Um, or how's your relationship like with your dad? Yeah. Like, do you hate your dad? Are you going to say, well, I'm not going to listen to a priest. I'm not going to tell father my sins. I don't want to listen to a guy with a funny hat. It's just like this. That's father papism. Hatred. Papism's where you worship your papa. Yeah. It's, it's daddy issues. It's just daddy. I mean, and what was that study? Will probably, you, you know, this, I'm sure the study about like how most atheists have like daddy issues basically. For sure. Um, so yeah. that stuff's a lot scarier in my opinion than like the rational arguments. Cause if it was, if it was pure chess, there would be no emotional responses when these things are brought up. But Mike, as you've experienced firsthand, like it's, it's o basically only emotion. And then like, there's a post talk, like, well, they rape kids. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> you're not serious. You're just like, you're being emotional about this. But, but the point Mike brings up about pride is really important because anyone who's got a proper understanding of human nature understands that we're not going to make decisions as if we are, angels i mean even the angels got a big decision wrong the ones who saw for all eternity the consequence of siding with lucifer and went with him but for human beings especially you don't make decisions based on pure logic and rationality pride can darken the intellect and there's all kinds of irrational motives for why someone might be a protestant and uh soloviev the orthodox theologian um a book of his to check out Russia and the Universal Church, 1889. Yeah. So he spent a couple of decades looking into the question of Catholicism and in the end, um, you know, concluded that the church is exactly what it says it is. And then he pleaded for the Eastern Orthodox churches to acknowledge the doctrine of papal supremacy. And then he ended up saying that, look, you can have all the biblical, historical, theological arguments lined up. You can make the rational case. But through reasons of the heart, some people still are not going to be convinced. And that's what you're talking about, Mike. Look into the heart. And, and that's what it required me to do, uh, sincerely. And this is part of, and, and to Nick's point as well, I was like, okay, maybe this has got to be this long, drawn-out process. Maybe I should wait till next Easter so I can really be sure. And that's the enemy, kicking the can down the road in this area of lukewarm. And I was presented with two options. And when you know, you know. And you have to go full bore into it. And so my recommendation to anybody is it humble your heart, ask God for that humility and to deconstruct your pride. And what I did was I went back and listened to all of C-Mask again. I read a lot of your articles. Well, a lot of your shows, Tim, answering questions about Sola Scriptura, uh, papal supremacy. I read the church fathers, which I mean, honestly, if you're just reading the early church fathers by themselves, you're going to be presented with. Yeah, it's a red pill. Two options, but really just one option um, if you don't have an authority problem. Um, <laughs> and what I what I've really in, in conclusion to this particular topic, what I've experienced now coming back was actually more freedom. I feel knowing there's guardrails, there's an answer to every question that I have regarding morality, regarding nature, uh, marital affairs. A any question that I have, I go, there's a Catholic teaching about that. And so I know how to operate mm -hmm. um, in my life um, as a well-ordered man because of these rules, because of these guardrails. And there's a, it's hard to explain, but I, I, I think you guys understand what I mean. There's a richness and fulfillment that comes with knowing your rules and your limitations and knowing there's a play, there's, there's ways to pay for sins and be, you know, confess of sins and penance and all of these things that has brought me closer to the kingdom, not, not hasn't drawn me away from it. These things are good. We need them. Yep. Faith is Dirty about submitting says. the intellect. Yep. Sorry, Tim. No, sorry. Sorry. I'm, I'm, tr I'm, I'm turning my volume up and then turning it down. Cause I got work going on at the house. So I'm sorry if I'm jumping in extra, I was just going to quote dirty Harry that every man's got to know his own limitations. But also, um, can we just skip to question two? Okay, if why not Protestantism? Why not Orthodoxy? Because uh, cool. you know both Nick and Will said something I wanted to key into, and then we can, yeah, anyone can jump on though. I, I think the Orthodoxy question is a lot more reasonable. Mm -hmm. It's a church. They have real bishops. They have real sacraments. They are a real church. Pope Benedict reaffirmed about ten years ago that we can call them a real church. You can't even call Protestant churches churches. They're congregations. Um, but what what Will said about Solovyov. He, he basically, he, he was a 
kind of mentor of Dostoevsky's. Dostoevsky hated the Catholic Church, of course, was Orthodox. And Slaviev ultimately said, I'm going to become Catholic because no matter, even if we have these 14 autocephalous brothers, the brothers without Papa can never come to the table, even to meet. And this is proven true in Orthodoxy. They cannot have a meeting with all 14 autocephalous churches. Look at Ukrainians. Um, you need Papa to call the brothers to the table. And this is in a family of brothers. Uh, if the father doesn't play a very active role, the grown-up brothers will squabble. This is a fact of males. It's just a fact because brothers are like, well, I'm my own man. The only person I will acknowledge is the head. And this requires papism. Also, with regard to orthodoxy on a specific key that Nick mentioned, even though there are more rules in orthodoxy and more guidelines, more bumper rails, most people, Nick said, that that don't choose Roman Catholicism just do you know they choose whatever they whatever the alternate they've opted for simply because they didn't like one or more of the rules orthodoxy is soft on pornea specifically mm. specifically divorce and contraception you know they use the internal forum there the way that the liberals in the catholic church are studying in study groups um the the, the Gallen group led by cardinal casper were studying the orthodox and they're like we should do this in the catholic faith and it, it's been, you know, pushed by Pope Francis. And Orthodox will say, ha, 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 Pope Francis is horrible. Yeah, he is horrible. But he's only horrible because he's wearing your clothes. You know, like <laughs> Jules says in Pulp Fiction, <laughs> that your clothes, mofo. That they're, Pope Francis is just pushing us to be Orthodox on the Pornea issues. And look how much pushback he's gotten. And he hasn't been able to do anything infallible. Uh, no irreformable teachings in the direction of Orthodoxy. So don't. The Orthodox, be careful how much you mock us on Pope Francis's uh, loosening of the rules, making more lenient the rules on Pornea, because we're the one worldview, not just the one religion. We're the one worldview in the world that doesn't acknowledge divorce. We're the one who's held true after the 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930 decade separated Lambeth conferences. Before 1900, no Christians accepted contraception did you guys know that not even mm. any protestants then the the then the basically early wef proto wef was pushing them hard each 10 years by by 1910 a lot more protestants accepted by 1920 the protestants and i i believe that's when the um a lot of the orthodox capitulated double check me um 1930 pretty much all the protestants capitulated then catholics are the only worldview that universally condemns and has always condemned for 2,000 years, contraception and divorce, the two biggest real temptations. Think about it this way. Transformers and, you know, Skittles, these are not temptations that are ubiquitous <laughs> or important to the life of most men. Most men are just straight dudes that want to score chicks, or even if they're, they're, they followed the rules with regard to one chick and they, they married one, they want to have zero rules maybe i want to have sex all the time and only like 1.7 children like all these um damn wasps around me here in america you can't do it so orthodoxy has just made lenient these rules and they don't have the pope and they, they have a lot of interesting ideas and and you know they share basically half of our history besides so it's not it's not a, an intellectually ridiculous worldview until you start looking at pornea and the fact that the pope as I said last week, exercised a universal jurisdiction in the fourth pope ever, very, very early on, before they even had telephones. It's quite remarkable. Without unity of government, so without a supreme head, you can't even have unity of faith either because there's no authority to actually teach and govern properly. So that's why you actually get even among the different Orthodox churches, disagreements over doctrine. Because like Tim was saying, you've got to have that head to actually say, this is it, submit. Because faith consists mainly in the submission of the intellect to teaching authority. And one thing that struck, stuck out to me is because I was doing this deep dive is that in all the Catholic and Orthodoxy debates, um, 
and I can I respect orthodoxy, the history, obviously the the unity that we once had in the shared sacraments. But in order to defend their position, you almost have to be a historian, and you justify it by me all these complicated means of what well, this council, this is what this happened, and this point of history, this conversation was had, and it's a lot of mental gymnastics. It doesn't. It's extraordinarily complex, almost just for the sake of being complex. Where obviously there's a complexity to the church, but there's a beautiful simplicity in understanding the rules and the authority and the structure. And, you know, uh, the Bible and God and this whole belief system being patriarchal just lends itself further to the idea of uh, having a pope, having somebody occupying the chair. Otherwise, you have brothers in this house with no father. And maybe this house is a little bit more orderly than this house over here because there are some rules, but there's still nobody occupying that seat of, of patriarch. Um and I, I believe they allow divorces up to three times. If I'm, I might be getting that mistaken. <laughs> and so, and so, Nick. I mean, I don't want to take over, but what are your thoughts? Why not orthodoxy for you? The I think the only other thing that I haven't said on the issue was um, I saw it as a similar issue to Protestantism just 400 years earlier. Basically, it's like okay, in 1517 we get Luther and. I look at that and just see see that as a very intellectually dishonest uh, divergence from something like okay, I want to interrogate the the original proposition, which is Catholicism, um, before it was even called Catholicism, and then you just go back four hundred more years, and it's the same sort of issue with like the filioque and the the splitting of the East and the West, and I just didn't <clears throat> because there was like an, a a second split or the first split before protestantism i just didn't want to spend the time doing exactly what you just said which was becoming a scholar like mm -hmm. getting a phd in theology and history to understand the stuff that like i hear tim and jay dialogue about like that's you go you study that for years you you have to be a smart person to understand that and and unfortunately this is the other thing that i recognized two ridiculously smart guys tim gordon and jay dyer disagree so what hope do i have yeah <laughs> <laughs> what what the hell am i supposed to do you know like yeah. i don't that's just not how i'm gonna get there and uh and you know i had i had extra curricular circumstances that sort of forced my hand but that that's i think it's much more a matter of the heart and you don't need it's not a um a competition of intellect that the only the smartest ones will find themselves in Catholicism or in the truth. If that was the case, then like the vast majority of humans would be damned. Yeah. And, and you've got guys like Slaviev, Cardinal Newman and others of that level of intellect who really have spent 20 years looking into it and have concluded in favor of Catholicism. So you can go ahead and do it yourself. You're probably not as smart as they are. You, or you can just look at what they concluded and you end up with the same role that pride plays in Protestantism sometimes. Yes. I, I, it doesn't just because you're a smart guy, it doesn't mean you've reached the correct conclusion for intellectual reasons. Sorry. And, and that seems to be a, a perennial issue for people, for men under the age of 25. And I'm not just saying that because like I'm in the church now and I'm 25, but just talking to other young men, it seems to be this sort of thing that, you know, if you're a sharp dude, you can sink your teeth into a subject and figure some things out and make some progress in, in other areas of life, whether it's like, you know, weightlifting or nutrition or, or a skill that you're doing for a job. And you think that translates to this and it does a little bit. Like I think Catholics or religious people should be knowledgeable, obviously you should be able to defend your faith at least to yourself. Um, nobody's, nobody here is proposing blind faith. I'm just saying that uh, I wasn't worshiping truth. I was worshiping knowledge. I was a Gnostic. Mm -hmm. I was worshiping my own capacity for knowledge, and it required p painful, painful humility to say, I give up. I'm convicted, and, and that's sort of where I started to understand what faith was for the first time in my entire life, that faith... Actually, Pat Coffin um, said this to me once, and uh, he was quoting a little book called The Bible, and it was like the first time I had heard this verse in Hebrews, that faith is the 
substance of things not seen in the, uh, the evidence of things hoped for in the substance of things not seen. And that was the first time that when I heard those words, I heard faith was evidence and substance, which is the exact opposite of how faith was described to me in Catholic school, which was faith is what you did when you had no good reason to accept a pre uh, premise. And mm -hmm. when I stopped this worship of my own intellect and Gnosticism, I finally was able to take a leap of faith that faith itself was something substantive. And then I received the gift of faith, which is to say I became convicted of the propositions that I could not reason my way to. I try, you know, somebody try to reason their way to transubstantiation. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Maybe you can. I don't, Tim, did, did Aquinas even, did he like reach apodictic certitude that like, well, of course you just do this syllogism and this bread is clearly the body of Christ. No, no he, just, he just showed that it's not, it's not anathema to reason. That's the okay. most. He, he was and worried. that's, that's where I think the core principles that you like, you're never going to reason to require this thing. And, uh, and that is not something that you're going to think your way to. That's what Dawkins thinks about religion. He thinks that someone just like walks walks along in a forest, sees a frog, and thinks, "Huh, that leg looks like it was designed." Therefore, the Trinity. That's that's <laughs> how he imagines it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is not to become Freudian here. Uh, Dawkins was in my dream last night. Interesting. Pine Sap and I were debating Richard Dawkins in a hotel about catholicism <laughs> for some reason i don't know if my brain was prepping for this episode or what but could be what were, were either of you for dawkins it doesn't seem like either of you would have been on the pro dawkins side no no we were we were debating we were both just oh you're debating yeah have Richard you ever met dawkins, pine yeah. sap in real irl no i haven't which is also odd that my brain was like this is my this is my debate partner pine sap <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah. Yeah, I think uh, on the orthodoxy thing, maybe we could just we can somewhat end it there. But I think what really gets a lot of young men is the um, what it looks like. The veneer yeah. is gritty and masculine and dark, and, and it is. It's very, very appealing in that way. Um, but then you know when you dig a little bit deeper, and I've you know I've talked to some people, and oh, it's it's very experiential. And I said, okay, mm -hmm. I understand what you mean, but that to me sounds like Protestantism. It's experiential. It is. Yeah, they, the, what it's got going for it, as my friend Joseph Polizotto said, is the three M's. They really emphasize mysticism, monasticism, and martyrdom. And mm -hmm. um, those three uh, appurtenants are not specific to the domain of orthodoxy. That's specific to true sacramental Christianity. So orthodox and Catholicism have the mystics, the martyrs, the, the monks. They just really lean into it. And that's why they tend to be a little more masculine, a bit more masculine, mm -hmm. but not that's not by design. The church over the last 60, really 100 years has leaned away from mysticism, martyrdom, monasticism. It's a it's a male church. Um, and therefore we we look fruitier. I mean, we look a lot fruitier, but we're we're mm -hmm. we're not. We have the same three M's that they do, plus we have a, a greater portion share of the truth. I would also say I was raised Byzantine Catholic as well as Roman Catholic by ritual. And at age five, I was on the altar in the Byzantine church um, with all of the smells and bells. And you did everything three times. And it was mostly sung in church Slavonic and post reversion or actually even pre reversion. I found the Latin mass to be far more aesthetically compelling. I found the, the, the true Roman tradition, you know, go watch, watch mass of the ages parts one two and three to see what's changed and i think if if somebody were to watch like those three documentaries or just understand the the aesthetic shift that happened they'd probably stop with the whole orthodox simping stuff because like the roman catholic church the traditional roman catholic church is epic it's beautiful it's compelling and like the orthodoxy it, it kind of reminds me of our when we did the episode before i joined the panel full time here um the Judeo Buddhist uh, in film, you know, in the absconding fathers and the Eastern substitution. The complex. Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. it's a lot of Miyagi complex stuff, and you kind of get your cake and eat it too as a young man if you go Orthodox. 
That's what we said. It's it's intra intra Christendom Miyagi complex. If you're not even right. if you don't even realize Christianity is true, then you're like Miyagi complex. I'm gonna get like an old Chinese grandpa to teach me karate because I don't right. have a dad, and then we'll like meditate together, and I'll find <laughs> out he was a war hero and America treated him shitty or whatever. But you know, Daniel son. But if you realize at least as much as Christianity is true, if you still have a little bit of the catching bug Miyagi complex. You're looking to the east, and you at least know, oh, I'll go Eastern Orthodox. And, like, the east Orthodox. didn't build anything, by the way. Like, the Roman Catholic Church, the Western tradition, Christianity, built everything that these people actually are finding aesthetically pleasing. And then they're substituting, they're backfilling the only other thing that they're deficient in, which is patriarchy. And... Th- I, I would propose that what we're doing with CMASC is just that. We're trying to rebuild the Catholic patriarchy, the thing that's deficient. And you don't need orthodoxy if you do that. Right. Well, I, I've never really felt the the pull of the so-called masculinity of orthodoxy. I don't know why, other than this particular quote from Patriarch Bartholomew in his interview in Time magazine, 1997. They asked him about birth control. And he just says this, and it's, one of the least masculine things I've ever heard. According to a long held tradition, the Greek Orthodox Church avoids dictating or making categorical decisions of a social or ethical nature. I was thinking, <laughs> bro, so you, you can't categorically decide whether the sexual revolution was wrong. <laughs> Get out of here. I was, oh, dude, I, that's, it was that's game, that was just game over for me. And then when you look into contraception, divorce, the technicalities, the fact that they've got no supreme head who can decide these things for them definitively, then that's not masculine. It's just pussy footing. A lot of them do happen to believe that it's wrong, of course. Great. They've got their head screwed on properly. But just believing that and having the actual doctrinal authority for it are two very different things. I wasn't aware of that quote. Mic drop. I, mic drop. Wow. That is a, yeah, that is a mic drop <laughs> moment. G-A-Y. For sure. G-A-Y. Yeah. <laughs> I think what it comes down to, and, and also the ethnic differences, you could choose, you know, you're Russian Orthodox, you're Greek Orthodox. You're, to me, it's just like a, but my head just spins like a top. And really what, what, what it comes down to is uh, a lot of these guys just have a problem with authority and they look at Pope Francis and they're like, I'm not following that guy. I know better. You don't, you don't know better. And I, and, and, and two, sorry, well, sorry. Well, one, one last thing, the same thing for Nick coming back to the church, Pope Francis was like irrelevant to me in my reversion. It didn't even make a difference. Yeah. I can respect him and not agree with him and, and understand papal supremacy all at the same time. Sorry, Will, go ahead. No, it's like the first pope denied Christ three times. I think there's a reason <laughs> for that. So, And he saw I, the resurrected Christ. Yeah, <laughs> but, but it, it involves more humility from us to realize that it's nothing magnetic or special about the guy who happens to occupy that particular seat. It means that you have to recognize human frailty and that this truly is something that's sustained by Christ's protection. If we had some 6'6", super-based, blonde, lifting, Viking-type guy as the Pope, and people were like, well, this, it's got to be true because of him. Look at him. Right. Yep. Right. Look, at his, look how based his ex account is. That would be far more spiritually dangerous. Look at that would actually be that would actually be uh, worshiping the Pope like Protestants say that we do. You're absolutely (laughs) so right. It's so right. Anyways, that was that was great. Great discussion, guys. I'm sure we could do a whole episode series on that alone. Okay, so you guys mentioned the Eucharist. Logical segue to that topic. Explain the Eucharist and transubstantiation. So just to share something why I started to research this more. I remember being at my church as I was starting to inquire about this. And they were taking the Eucharist, the Eucharist. I say that with, you know, um, and so they give me this little fruit cup, this little, uh, this little with grape juice in it and with this little cracker on top. And the pastor's talking about um, eating the body and drinking the blood. And I'm opening this thing and I'm tasting (laughs) the juice and I'm eating the cracker. And I'm not joking. This was before I was even convicted. I felt disgusted. I felt that this was a, a, an insult to scripture. It was an insult to the tradition, an insult to communion, an insult to Christ. 
and I wasn't sure where that was where that was coming from. But it's it, it's amazing how the, the the spirit knows truth. So that that's what got me knocking on the door. And so now coming back around, this is one of those topics that's very confusing to people. So how could we explain the Eucharist transubstantiation um, and why that little fruit cup with the cracker on it is not communion in the Protestant church? Well, I can begin with a somewhat funny anecdote of my own, which is that before Tim G, there was a Tim G in my life. Uh, this Tim Gordon got the much kinder version of Nick Tim Glimkowski, my theology and philosophy teacher in high school, uh, did not. He got a very arrogant, contentious Nick, and uh, that was a that was a whole saga at the sort of beginning of my atheistic phase. But in an attempt to rebalance the karmic scales, I say that tongue in cheek, obviously. Um, I will repeat the thing that he taught me, which I believe is very compelling. Uh, even for the Sola Scriptura Bible thumpers of Protestants, which is the Bread of Life discourse makes it extremely clear what Christ is saying. And you have to go through an intense amount of mental gymnastics to think that what Christ said was anything but what the Catholic Church is currently practicing every Sunday. And it's quite simply that when Christ says the first time, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will not have life within you. The Greek word that he uses is phago, which is the general form of eat. And the crowd responds in the first way, being very confused and upset. And so Christ reiterates himself and gets more specific. And the second word that he uses for eat is trogo, which is to gnaw or chew. And the crowd gets so upset that they depart, and then he turns to his apostles and says, will you also leave me? And Peter says, where have we else to go, my Lord? That is the entire tradition of the Eucharist, or the start of it. Obviously, the Last Supper is the instantiation of the Eucharist. Where have we else to go? This is the proposition, that you must consume the body of Christ. Beautifully said. I just learned about those Greek definitions of those words somewhat recently, and it, it blew the lid off this. Um, so, uh, Tim, how would you explain this to someone that's confused? I think <laughs> that's sufficient. Um, if you believe Sola Scriptura, that includes John chapter 6, verses 35 through 70, or, or, or whatever comprises the uh, bread of life discourse, and they just won't touch it. I, I don't know. I, I've asked innumerable Protestants, what of that, the bread of life discourse? What I usually get is, I'll get back to you. You know, there's a Protestant who taught at uh, Garces, the Catholic school I taught at a while, and he was like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. I was like, what say you? And then he was like, I'll get back to you. And we continued to teach at the school for at least uh, another year, and he never got back to me. Because it's this is a matter of the will, not the intellect. Protestants will will throw the Eucharist at you. You believe in the real presence, as if it's a matter of the intellect. It's not. It's of the will. I just I just threw John chapter six thirty five to seventy ish at you. I would also um, add that uh, I think Trogo. It it's it's a more mechanical, more by rote description of gnawing eating it's specifically associated with animal gnawing and it's also interesting is it not that that in the nativity scene jesus is laying in a, a little animal bed in animal feeding trough right and then you think about the fact that that was his first bed a, a manger an animal feeding trough and then later he uses the expression well i lay myself out to be eaten and he uses an animal feeding term so it's it's very very literal. It's almost crass, uh, mm -hmm. almost but not crass. How literal it is! I, I you just can't do better than the bread of life discourse. That's my answer. If I could bounce right off that as well, the I can't. I can't I'm so excited. I'm absolutely ecstatic that I get to bring up Ray Pete on CMask podcast. One of my favorite thinkers of all time, as Tim knows. Um, but I was thinking about what Tim was saying about the the idea of 
consumption and you hear a lot of times eating as, um, you know, Christ wants to dwell within you and you commune with him and you have communion and, but the, it seems to be held in contrast with the marital act as what we conceive of as the most intimate uh, engaging of two souls is the marital act. And that's true in the sense of men and women. But how would that work when the sexes are the same? What I propose, and this is, again, taking from Ray Pete, is actually the most intimate way we connect with our environment is through food. Because that's where you take something external, you put it into your body, you blast it into its constituent parts, and you pass it through 200 feet of yourself and assimilate every little bit of it. And that's true for men and women. Men and women eat. They have to. It's required. That is the most intimate way that you can connect with something else, is to assimilate it into your own body, not sex. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time I realized this, that if he wanted to do, if, if Christ wanted to um, be intimate with people, all people, it couldn't be in something that was exclusive to heterosexuality. It had to be something that was universally intimate, which is the consumption of food. Beautifully said, Nick. Will? <clears throat> I would say that a, a child who hasn't read lots of theology books and wouldn't be able to engage in complex debate with all these Protestant theologians with their own take on the Eucharist, just by submitting to the teaching authority of the church, and you know we're told that unless we become as children, we can't enter the kingdom of heaven, just by submitting his intellect to that teaching authority um, has greater knowledge of God and love of him than some guy like James White with a really long gray beard and a fancy Bible that's going to be covered in a, you know, gold leaf and like bound in purple vellum or something. You, there's no way you can read yourself into a greater state of holiness than a child who just submits to the teaching authority of the church. And the, the Eucharist for that reason entails that beautiful kind of submission because what the senses perceive is just bread, but having the faith in it, and reading scripture, seeing that Christ says, this is my body. And thinking about the church really teaching, no, this really is. And that's it. You just submit to that. The Eucharistic miracles in particular were mm -hmm. very convincing to me as well. And I was sitting down reading some of them with my wife. And the fact that these were all confirmed by secular scientists and, and people of the like was, was because I, it was hard for me to wrap my, my head around that. Um, um, but th those by itself and Nick, I've never heard it articulated in that way about the intimacy piece of, you know, eating and, and whatnot. It's, it, it's, it's beautiful. And I find myself too, as I progress in this journey, there's this greater and greater and greater desire to partake in the Eucharist. It's like this growing flame. Mm -hmm. Um, and so w to me, which I know it's, it's kind of emotional experiential, but further proof to me that I'm headed in the right direction. And so for people that need somewhat kind of like proof beyond what we just presented to them, reading the Eucharistic miracles was really helpful for me. Yeah. You, yeah. You those know, miracles. Sorry. Go ahead. Well. I was going to say, you know, when they on occasion have to you know search churches, whether it's to do with bomb squads, whatever it might be, when a sniffer dog goes into a church, um, it can detect life in the Eucharist. Like it will do the thing it's trained to do when there's life. It will just sit, point, and say, I've found something living here. And, you know, it, it can't see a human being, but they've found that a few times. It's really interesting. Wow. Wow. Nick? Yeah, when I was an atheist, the, I remember reading through the stories of the Eucharistic miracles, and I distinctly remember my heart rate going up because I didn't have anything to counter besides the fact that I was a a, a magician for a long time and at that time I guess like a Hegelian so I was like well miracles can't happen miracles are all tricks people lying or people being wrong and not knowing it those are the only three options and I think it was Hegel Tim correct me if I'm wrong where basically the the probability of a miracle happening is always less than the probability of 
some other explanation therefore like it's more reasonable to say that miracles never happen than that miracle does which is just like an intellectually deficient way of looking at things um and now on the other side of it this is this is again why like the intellect is is not going to save you most of the time on these things because now on the other side of it you can look back at the eucharistic miracles and be like oh my goodness this is so beautiful and edifying to read about these things when you're in the midst of atheism and you read these things you're just man Catholics are so dumb to think, to to believe these fairy tales. Like obviously everybody's in on it. <laughs> yeah, well said. It's funny, I'm, and on the point of um, James White, I would like to personally thank him because he was part of my reversion to Catholicism. So thank you. I think James White <laughs> has been responsible for more people converting to Catholicism than anybody else. Because when you look at the landscape, he's the best that the Protestants got, right? And so when you look at it, and you're like, this is the 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 best that they've got. You're like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, over, I'm going over here. Well, he's, got you, the, my, he's, you... he's got the greatest beard, right? So he, he must. He be. That's how they measure it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the greatest beard outside of Eastern Orthodoxy. To be that's right, uh, right. Mike, that's did right. you were you converted by listening to Trent Horn versus James White debate number one thousand one hundred fifty six? <laughs> Trent Horn versus James White number one thousand one hundred fifty seven. Why, why waste the time? I, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand the Catholic fixation with James White. It's I like stuck in the nineties. It's like uh, Gore Vidal it's... and William Buckley, but like boring. <laughs> yeah, like let's just do this because we like watching like these two guys. Like, just kind of no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like trilogy fights, except boring. Yeah. It's like Rumble in the Jungle, or it's like uh, yeah. I don't know. Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, except really, really boring and banal. And it's like, oh, I don't God. get it. I do not get it. Like, I don't know. Aaron doesn't get why Michael likes Holly Flax. I do not get the Catholic obsession with James White. And I, I don't understand why anyone would tune in for debate number 1,156 or 57 between Trent Horn and James White. It yeah. is boring. I, I, there's far more debates need to be getting had between Catholics and Orthodox. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons that um, we've spent some time on it here today. And one of the reasons in, in a kind of brothership, Jay Dyer and I have, have um, become friendly. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about because we're a lot closer together. I don't get the Catholic Protestant um, nonstop apologetics. It's read the bread of life discourse, see my, you know, scholars mate four moves to prove sola scriptura is false. Realize Brilliant. it's a 500 year old made up religion and it's a book club. It's a book cult. Um, it's yeah. I, I don't get it. You you can <laughs> learn from it that corrupt minds can't be reasoned with as Elizabeth yeah. Anscombe can put it. You can just see that white can't get it. Um, God debating him could also set out the points and he still needs to actually submit his will, and it needs to be a matter of the heart as well as the intellect. So Trent Horn hasn't got a chance. That dichotomy, I think, is is probably at the heart of most of this, at least for men. I don't I don't know how women would approach this question. Um, I'd leave that to the fathers and husbands here to articulate that more. But from like a just a purely male standpoint, the the idea that you can assent with your will to an intellectual belief is I, th I think it seems contradictory at first um, that my, my friend Swade on Twitter actually just posted about this recently as well, that like you actually do choose what you believe. You mm -hmm. think you, you think you don't, you think it's, it's sort of downstream from a bunch of syllogisms and then you, you like, it's a standing wave of this is now what I believe as a result of all these processes. And that's true for some beliefs, but it doesn't work with, a lot of the, the most important ones where it's an act of the will. And I think it would probably behoove people trying to get from trying to cross the Tiber to spend time on the question of, is it intellectually dishonest to make an act of the will to assent to a proposition? Are you violating any rational principles? And when you realize as Tim alluded to Aquinas saying like, no, it does not offend reason to assent to these propositions then the only thing that's left is the matter of the heart okay why aren't you and then you realize oh it's nothing to do with the intellect anymore i got as far as it can get me and now and what's 
I think truly beautiful about that is that means that Christ is speaking individually to each person's heart. It is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of your virtue and your conviction. Uh, and so it kind of you know, point for Protestants. Oh, he said, just believe in me. Yeah. Okay. Well then do it. That's an act of the will. Do it. He didn't say become a Pharisee, become a scholar. And look, he debated the Pharisees at 12 years old. He's standing in the temple, dazzling all of them with his, with his knowledge. And then they killed him. Congrats. You're doing the same thing. Protestants. Yep. I, I don't, don't forget <laughs> that. The, the Ten Commandments just clarified natural law. We even needed to have natural law revealed to us just for the moral certitude because the pagan philosophers left to themselves, despite many very gifted intellects being among them, made all kinds of mistakes. Plato and Aristotle both rationalized abortion. So you, you need to get even just the natural law revealed and clarified fully because of the darkness of the human intellect, totally unaided. So the idea that you're going to just figure out all the divine truths for yourself as well is peak delusion. Yeah. Yeah. And so a, a couple of debates in particular, the Trent Horn ones, I, I couldn't, I couldn't sit through, but uh, the ones in particular with Patrick Madrid and Jimmy Aiken were really good. I think those guys uh, put on a clinic in those particular debates, but other than that, yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough, uh, tough listen. Now, what I, and this is a separate round altogether. I won't spend too much time on it. I find it really, really funny that uh, the reformers on X are some of the most um, least charitable or some of the least charitable and it's uh, people uh, in, in the faith space in general. And I wonder why do they all look the same? Why do they all wear sweater vests and jeans and have the same beard and same like ha 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 demeanor about Christian nationalism. It's the most cringe shit I've ever seen in my life. This is why I don't even like participate in those circles anymore. I'm like, you guys are all the, you guys all look like different versions of Doug Wilson and Jeff Durbin. What's happening here? <laughs> it's so frustrating, man. It's like this just this giant circle jerk. And I'm sure like, you know, the ortho bros and the, the trad cats, like they we have, you know, our own versions of that, but it's, it's very bizarre. And the the arrogance that just like just exudes off of these people. I guess that's what happens when your theology theological worldview is a is a uh, based in protest of the truth. I guess that's just what the natural fruits of that are. Yeah, I was recently asked what uh, it means to be cool, <laughs> and my response was that cool is something that only Catholics can do, and ninety nine percent of Catholics don't do. <laughs> yeah that's fair that, that's fair too i'll i'll give the catholics that as well it's like <laughs> truth it's like truth and then 99 only catholics can do it and 99.9 percent .9 don't or yeah. truth or cool and and i'm saying cool in the same vein because i believe it's predicated on truth and it's a balancing act it's like a mimetic desire thing you know like this is why i think the the failure of patriarchy in the Catholic church over the last hundred years has been so detrimental to young men because there's no mech desire. It's not cool. I don't want to be a Catholic. If I've got to be like these, these goobers here, there's nothing attractive or cool yeah. about that. The one thing I'll say about the reformers, at least there's some emasculine edge to a lot of them um, where like, you know, when you listen to, and I particularly like what Trent Horn has to say, but when you listen to Trent Horn or Michael Lofton, you're like, I don't, no man like no nah, this, this, this. <laughs> well, i mean you can go back and listen to my 2019 debate with trent I, I i sent actually sent it to pearl the other day um you know can christians be feminists with 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 trent and he's saying yes and he's arguing tooth and nail for Come yes on. that's coming up to the five-year anniversary of that later this year it was a big big debate made a big wave at the time i was in catholic answers they were trying to convince me. I'm like, let's not hang this. I think it's a bad look for you both. I was like, I think it's a bad look for Trent. I think it's a very good look for me because um, of how I I just uh, performed and what I was saying. And and um, I, it's it's just true. Ninety nine point nine percent of Catholics don't do truth. Don't do cool. Hundred percent of everyone else doesn't do it. And and I, I said this <laughs> in response to atheists the other day. Atheists are like, religious people are stupid. It's like, yeah. 99.5% <laughs> of them 
hundred percent of atheists are stupid though. See, I, I believe, in, <laughs> I believe in a, a hyper muscular version of Sturgeon's law. Sturgeon's law is that 90% of everything is crap. I believe that 99% of all persons, places, and things are crap. <laughs> of course the persons can be saved, but I just, <laughs> I don't, you know, through, through Christ and through the sacraments, but yeah, I just believe most Catholics are, are quite cringe, but all of everyone else completely cringe. True. True. Um, I'm not sure how are you guys doing for time. Cause there's a couple other things I had for questions on here, but I'll go to about easy. five Let's minutes. Do Let's do them fast. Let's do it. Machine okay. Gun. Sure. I think, okay. I think why not good. Protestantism, right? Why not orthodoxy required uh, a long time, but let's just machine gun the rest. True. So the last two were the number one intercession of saints and praying to them. Easy. They're, they're not dead. Okay. And Will. their prayers are worth more than our prayers are. Protestants pray for each other. You know, I, I can pray for you guys, but it's going to be more powerful if the Virgin Mary prays for you because she's better at praying and her prayers count for more than my do. And to quote mm. scripture, the prayers of the righteous availeth much. Hmm. Tim, thoughts on this? Agree. <laughs> yeah, nothing easy. else that you just, said I, there. I, yeah, you have to be retarded not to understand that it's okay. <laughs> it's Christian to ask people to pray for you. You're a retarded. You know, okay. It's that simple. It's okay, so easy. great. Yeah. Yeah. That one was like the least of my my concerns yeah. really either too. It was easily explained. Okay, purgatory. You can't find that in the Bible, bro. What's purgatory? How do we quickly explain that? Uh first up, I reject your framing. I don't care about what you think you can find in the Bible. Let's just get that out of the way first. I'm not That's accepting the right you answer. the debate. Um there are bits in the Bible which um imply the doctrine of purgatory and the church teaches it. You can also think about the fact that, fine, if you're one of the very, very few people who, who becomes a saint um, and you die and you go straight to heaven, great. It's probably not going to happen to you. Most people are going to be lucky to even uh, make it to purgatory rather than hell. And that means that you haven't yet reached the state where you are so perfect that you're allowed into heaven because nothing imperfect is allowed in, right? Now, realistically, that's not going to be pretty much anybody when they die, you've got imperfections left. And that means that there's a state after death where those can be burned away because you need the extra work. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, yeah. And it's just, uh, there, there's a couple passages like Will mentioned that insinuate in the Bible, but they're, they're not altogether convincing. What's convincing is purgatory is a philosophical residuum, meaning it's, um, a leftover concept when we bracket, when we bracket out the proper things that need to bra be bracketed from the math. It's downstream of the um, faith alone versus faith and works conversation or debate between Protestants and Catholics. It's, that's really all it is, and, and Will just explained why. That's a very stupid debate that only retards really engage in. Also, because Luther, we know, we've confirmed, added the word um, alone to the, the epistle to the Romans. Faith without works is dead, and... Um, Christ says, of course, the, the gospel of life discourse, you need to perform the work of the sacraments, you know, specifically, you, you can't receive unworthily, you'll receive death, as St. Paul also says in the Bible. And um, what do you need to have life in you? The Eucharist. So we've covered it all. These things mean that, okay, faith and works is the definitive teaching of, of all Christians. Luther literally had to etch into the Bible faith alone. He adds the word alone. He's just he's just a liar, a uh, 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 a damnable liar who uh, killed killed two men in duels and said these these damn monkish robes are the only reason he wrote it air for it. These are the only reasons I'm here is because I it's I'd be a uh, it's a capital offense I'd be killed if I weren't uh, here in these damn monkish robes. And you know he's quite quite the grifter, Luther, and the whole thing's rather see through. When you, when you go to purgatory, then it's very, very obvious that because works do matter, very few people are the Blessed Virgin Mary or Elijah being taken to heaven directly. And uh, that there has to be some way of, of purging out. We don't know if it's a place or a time. It might be instantaneous. Purgatory might be fast. It might not be particularly bad. We just know there has to be a means of purgation. And the official de fide teaching of the church is just that we don't know much. It just has to be a kind of spatio-temporal pass-through 
um, whereby the less blessed can become fully blessed. That's all mm -hmm. it is. I, I, I know some Protestants are going to be listening, thinking, well, it's okay, so at least give me something in Scripture. Um, you need to look at Matthew 12, 32, uh, where Christ speaks of sin, which shall not be forgiven either in this world or in the world to come, which implies that there are indeed some sins which are forgiven in the world to come. Now, that's not going to be in hell because there's no forgiveness there. And it's not going to be in heaven because there's no sins there. So that implies purgatory. So just listen to what the church teaches, and it's drawing out what's actually contained in Scripture. And we don't have to buy the framing that just because you, reading that verse, can't figure out it entails purgatory, that anybody has to care. Sorry. There's also the precedent of the bosom of Abraham for like a, right. some in-between place, so. Exactly. Beautifully said, gentlemen. That was a tremendous conversation. I think we'll have to revisit this. There's probably more questions. Of course, there's more questions we could probably address. But um, again, very edifying. Thank you, gentlemen. God bless you all. And we'll catch you all next week. God bless, guys. Okay. Take care. Good to speak to you. See you.